Hello, this is the second supplementary lecture for week 10, The Age of Globalization. And we're going to look at uh, another commodity. So let's start off our story by going back to 1998, where a shipwreck was discovered just off the uh, island of Belitung. Uh, and this is in Indonesia, really on the, uh, located on the edge of the Java Sea. So what's so remarkable about this shipwreck is that it contained more than 60,000 ceramics produced in China during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, and it also had a lot of uh, gold and silver on it. So uh, the ship, as it was later discovered, departed from Canton and was bound for Iraq or Iran. Right, uh, and, and this really is an evidence of the long-standing commercial links between China, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Today, you can find the collection being showcased at Singapore's Asia Civilization Museum, and it is one of the central showpiece of the museum. Uh, if you bother looking at the website, uh, it interestingly contains the following statement. Uh, so it says, Southeast Asia lay at the heart of a global trading network in the 9th century. Singapore's success as an exchange point of global shipping is thus rooted in ancient history. The objects recovered from the shipwreck, some of exceptional rarity, testify to the ingenuity of artists and merchants and show the lengths to which the world's consumers would go to obtain such commodities. End quote. So in many cases, it's a very interesting example of how archaeological finds today uh, services nationalist narrative and in fact helps to reinforce and project Singapore's uh, national importance within a global economy uh, by giving legitimacy to what it is today by drawing on the past. And this is something that we're going to try to unpack and see if there are uh, ways to complicate this uh, story. Um, to do so, maybe we can uh, explore this in relation to the Zhu Fan Zhi, which is the gazetteer of foreign lands. I've shared with you the website, and you can find this in the course information guide as well. Um, it's really an 13th century ethnographic uh, account uh, with lots of geographical information on nearly 60 foreign countries known to uh, the Middle Kingdom through trade relationships uh, uh, during that period in time. Uh, there were also a couple of imaginary countries uh, that were based on Arab myths, but by and large it's uh, 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 quite an accurate record. Uh, so it's a two-part volume and how it's framed is that you have the geographical information and then an uh, extensive descriptive account of the various foreign trade commodities that have entered the Chinese market. Uh, right. So the author was an official uh, who composed the text around the 13th century, very often uh, gathering, basing it on earlier Chinese sources and also uh, through extensive uh, consultation with foreign merchants who he had interviewed. Uh, though he was someone who never traveled out of uh, South China, uh, but he was stationed in a major port city uh, uh, called Quanzhou in Fujian. And as a supervisor of maritime trade, he was able to interact with um, um, sailors coming from all parts of uh, the world uh, who brought with them not only the goods themselves, but also knowledge about their place of origin. In many ways, uh, the descriptive accounts and, uh, and the catalogue of, um, of, of places recorded in the Gazetteer corresponded very closely with uh, what we know of as the Indian Ocean Trade Network. So let's look uh, closer at the shipwreck because I think it allows us to telescope outwards to explore this larger narrative. Um, in a sense, being attentive and sensitive to museological message can not only help us to 
become aware of the limitation uh, if we only were to take what the museum tells us at face value, but if we were to just make a bit of effort and uh, try to connect uh, what we see and what we hear, it doesn't really take long for a much more complicated and nuanced narrative uh, to emerge. Uh, really, uh, where we need to begin is by uh, going back to the objects of study again and see what other kinds of story that they might contain. One of the thing about archaeology is that it's never really a neutral feel. Uh, any archaeological excavation is necessarily a political one because it involves so many actors um, requiring uh, different uh, agencies and departments to work collaboratively and often uh, requiring even uh, public and private collaboration. So as a result of the scale in which archaeological excavations are undertaken, uh, very often uh, it uh, cannot escape from being interpreted through a nationalist lens. So really, you know, what we, when we are exploring something like the Belitung shipwreck, uh, you know, a simplistic question such as whose shipwreck is it really is something uh, that can be contested uh, by different players and actors. Um, and when, you, when it comes down to it, does, do shipwrecks actually have owners? And while to many, the answer might be obvious uh, and, or, and to them, there really only is one answer. It's when we recognize that there are conflict in views uh, that I think it should spur us into also rethinking whether uh, the questions that we have posed out needs to be uh, rethought or thought through in a more careful manner. So it is not enough uh, for a historian or an art historian to simply just say such competing views exist and leave it as that. We also perhaps need to understand uh, what is the conflict or the competing views symptomatic of? What does it, what is it a symptom of? Does it indicate something else altogether? At the heart of it, you know, the shipwreck can be understood as a politics of ownership and culture. Shipwreck in Indonesia, archaeological funding from Singapore, propagandized by, you know, the Singapore government. Um, with ceramics that were made in China, responding to a demand and a market uh, that it, from the Middle East and Iran, does it make it Singapore? Or is it Indonesian? Or is it Chinese? Or ultimately, is it Middle Eastern? Since, you know, they were commissioned and reflect the taste of Middle Easterners. Uh, so are they Chinese because they're made in the ceramic kiln south of China? Are they Indonesian since the shipwreck is discovered off the coast of an island that belongs to uh, uh, the Indonesian uh, territory today? Or are they now Singaporeans simply because they sit in a museum and connect Singapore's significance as a maritime atropod to a historical past? Uh, so, or is this really perhaps asking us to rethink this question of ownership, to ask if we can uh, re uh, revise the way we often attribute uh, uh, an art object uh, to a particular culture, and in doing so, very often underplay the exchange and circulation of the object that unsettles our very uh, easy and comfortable assumption, as well as anxiety uh, to uh, decide very firmly on which culture does the artifact or object belong to. So perhaps one angle that speaks to what we've been trying to do in this course is to discover the Southeast Asian perspective uh, rooted in a worldview that is local uh, so that we might have to look at the instances of use 
where the purpose. However, this is only really one approach and really when you decide on what approach to use, whether you want to adopt an approach that focuses on the local perspective or an approach that focuses on exchange or a focus that focuses on the material, all of these needs to uh, justify, be justified as to what new insight can that particular approach bring to our understanding of, say, the object. So let's take the Marta Banja that you're seeing here as an example. Uh, normally, we would uh, attribute this to uh, its uh, as Chinese export trade wear. So when we think of it as something that is traded commercially, we don't often associate uh, the object with any sense of um, uh, uh, the sacred, right? When we think of trade, we think of objects entering an economy of circulation that renders it quotidian, that renders it everyday and mundane. Uh, but this is not always the case. Uh, so for the Kenya people in Sarawak, um, the, the use of uh, these uh, Chinese uh, export trade ceramics as burial jar was a continuation of a long-standing custom of, of jar burials uh, where one interns uh, the secondary remains of um, you know the deceased in locally made terracotta urns and this dates back to the middle ages as can be seen from the discoveries made in Guania limestone caves uh, and this was discovered in the late 50s by uh, the curator of the Sarawak Museum then Tom Harrison and his wife Barbara Harrison. Uh, so similar jars have also been found in Sabah and uh, interestingly Trungano. So funerary culture uh, in many indigenous animist community uh, has a two-step uh, process uh, of internment. So uh, at the early stage, uh, it is customary to often keep the deceased person within the house, usually storing him or her in the upper area of the home so that family members could still communicate with uh, the deceased uh, for a period of time. Perhaps this is a way of coping with the passing on of someone. Uh, and mark, this often marks a period of transition where you learn how to also slowly let go. Uh, this might take, uh, you know, up to a year or so. Then, at a later date, at a later date, when the body had, uh, on some levels, decay, uh, the bones were then uh, gathered and put into a jar. And this was then either taken to a platform, uh, the high burial platform deep in the forest or they can also be interred in the ground. In some cases, the body was originally buried until the family had enough money to carry out the proper rites, uh, while the remains were later on dug up and then transferred into a jar for the proper final send-off. And so with the send-off, then it marks the final uh, uh, separation between the living and the dead. So therefore, the burial jars themselves take on a much more meaningful and ritualistic purpose with meaning highly contextual to uh, the Kenya people. So in this sense, focusing on local use and meaning making around objects of global trade uh, does help us to cast new light and interpretive dimension to how the objects was made sense in uh, at the point of its reception, uh, and this can be very specific. Uh, uh, however, in each um, example, uh, in each um, you know uh, research, uh, what it goes to show is that it can help us to complicate what we understand to be a, the process of globalization as well. Okay. Uh, then turning to its use, um, you know, looking at objects in relation to how it's being actually, um, how it actually functions within, you know, everyday use uh, could in many ways show us dimensions uh, of the object that uh, we, that no longer have any cultural purchase in the present day, such as the candies, which is a regular feature 
of almost all the homes across Southeast Asia. And it makes sense to have a Kandu because you don't have a modern uh, water irrigation system or uh, piping that runs through one's home. And therefore, uh, you know, having a Kandu uh, in front of one's house, and this is a cooling uh, pot, a uh, ceramic pot made of clay that uh, uh, you're able to store water. Uh, and it's a generous feature of one's home where you are offering water as a sign of hospi hospitality to anyone who passed by and anyone could, uh, in effect, uh, you know, uh, take a sip of drink even if they are a traveller simply passing by. In a certain way, paying attention to use then uh, allows us to also discover things that are no longer present in our society today, yet they contain values, ideas, as well as uh, ways in which to think about our built environment and our everyday life differently, uh, that it would be a shame if this is only thought of in terms as historical knowledge of something that is of the past that has no, contribu no capacity to contribute to the way we uh, address um, you know, contemporary issues. Uh, so thinking of use, therefore requires us to also think creatively of how do objects exist in the world and in fact what do they what what do they tell us what do they want from us how do they sort of find and acquire new ways of existing in the world so paying attention for example in how uh, ceramics of all kinds and varieties and sorts and these are by the millions right it's really when you come back to thinking about the way they find their place in the world existing in some of the most unexpected places that uh, you're likely to actually discover something uh, more interesting Take, for example, this amazing uh, collection. Uh, I've only shown six out of the many thousands that have been uh, recently digitized. And these belong to different collections uh, uh, of uh, various people uh, in the Karinchi uh, area in Sumatra. Uh, so the British Library under the Endangered Archive Program uh, began to... Uh, work with various researchers and one of the projects was to dis, uh, digitize the heirlooms of various families and homes and these are uh, when you go through their collection it's not a big collection and it is in the smallness of collection that I think uh, uh, something quite touching and seeing how these are cared for preserved and passed down from one generation to another uh, when we think of the heirloom, heirlooms are not just historical objects. They are also carriers of history because they are object-based history in the sense that such collections often direct our awareness to examples of how uh, people experience beauty uh, beyond that of the court tradition. Uh, you know, and this was during a time when you had philosophers like Immanuel Kant who was making a case for the universality of sense perception as a faculty for us to know things, uh, to become intelligent, right? It's an intellectual faculty. Aesthetics is an intellectual faculty. So uh, if this is something that is universal, then clearly, uh, uh, you know, in that same register, we too are able to now detect from all the fragmentary evidences uh, that when pieced together, reveal something of how the ordinary people were also uh, capable of being stirred and roused emotionally uh, by this faculty to, uh, through the act of beholding, uh, you know. Uh, and, and this is really a process of knowing the world, uh, of trying to sort of see uh, and recognize uh, meaning out of the things that circulate through the world. Uh, perhaps this is something common to all humanity. Uh, so let's take a, a bit of a travel to another side of the Indian Ocean to look at how, for example, before the 14th century, uh, Chinese ceramic wares have uh, gained currency 
as decorative features of Islamic tombs on the east coast of Africa. You know, before the 14th century, uh, it, it was, there was already a kind of like a popular demand for a type of southern Iranian pottery called the Sagra Fiato. Uh, and however, these were gradually substituted by Chinese wares uh, around the 14th to 15th century. You know, this is evidenced by how the Chinese uh, large and shallow bowls were used as decorative elements within uh, the tomb complex, often adding a new ritual and uh, prestige dimension to those tombs. Moreover, uh, because they are very much tied to uh, um, the Islamic tombs on the East Coast, East African coast, uh, it is therefore uh, an indication that uh, the use of these Chinese uh, uh, wares are also strongly connected to the spread of Islam. In fact, Muslim merchants had since, uh, for a long time, maintained close trade relationships with China through the maritime routes, and previous examples have shown you, uh, have given you an idea how even in the Tang Dynasty, uh, this could be uh, evidence in the shipwreck uh, that happened off the uh, island of Belitong. Uh, so, uh, in terms of how this, uh, how the um, ceramic ware participates in the social life of uh, uh, Muslim communities uh, along the Swahili coast, uh, very often it's tied to the feast as a social practice in which people actually use those occasions to negotiate relationships, pursue economic and political goals, compete for power, and reproduce and contest ideological representations of social order and authority. On these occasions, imported goods such as Chinese wares act as useful tools in rituals of consumption, becoming a necessary part of the constitution of power and authority rather than a mere reflection of them. So we are really trying to move away from thinking of uh, uh, these objects as merely representative. And in fact, they are projective and constitutive of powers as well, uh, given that they act, uh, they don't only reflect or, or symbolize, right? Uh, so porcelain, uh, therefore, uh, was staged and presented on the Swahili coast. Uh, and uh, when pressed into wet plaster of the ornamental areas of stone memorials and moss, they become really part of the permanent surface of the architecture. And it articulates, uh, articulating themselves in this monument as early as the 13th century, uh, right? Uh, so although less common, porcelain plates were also, uh, you know, stuck onto the ceilings of palaces. Uh, uh, and by the 18th century, uh, it became so prevalent that a lot of merchant mansions, and now not only the royals of this, on the Swahili coast, were beginning to adopt this as part of their culture by displaying uh, all these ceramics were in the interiors of their merchant houses. In many ways, this mode of display is not so different from the way uh, uh, interiors in faraway palaces in Europe was also trying to uh, create a kind of overwhelming effect, uh, uh, effect by the use of hundreds of plates covering walls. Uh, of uh, the, the houses or the, the, the palaces of the elite. So porcelain, for example, uh, in these uh, cases, you can see them being used in the uh, Schaltenberg Palace in Berlin, as well as the famous Santos Palace in Lisbon, where 250 Ming porcelain were stuck onto the ceiling of this particular palace, uh, uh, which serves as the French embassy in Portugal today. So uh, well, when porcelain was traded, it was traded alongside other commodities, including textiles, spices, foodstuff, gold, ivory, and also, importantly to acknowledge, enslaved human. So most, important were, this, most of imports were discretionary rather than necessities, and therefore 
African consumer demand focus on luxury goods. It, uh, and these goods had certain capital because they served the purpose of communicating social meaning. Imports such as textiles, textiles had complicated material trajectory uh, since they were completely transformed uh, in terms of their meaning to fit a local context. But uh, porcelain was also another luxury goods that signal rarity and exclusivity uh, in, in which uh, certain segments of the societies who could afford it then could use it to participate uh, in a ritual of exchange and display. Uh, and in this sense, we can think of these dishes and plates as subject of a remarkably inventive display programs in people's homes uh, in different parts of the world, right? And so Europe has its china rooms. Uh, individual dishes were inserted into elaborate gold silver mounds for display in ornamental cases, or they were directly mounted on walls, for example. Uh, so by the second half of the 17th century, Portuguese increasingly lost control of the Indian Ocean Empire of their Indian Ocean presence. So uh, with this, the Mombasa, with the help of uh, merchant princes from Oman, defeated their former oppressor in 1698, and Omani Arab presence and power in East Africa increased from then onwards. And this led to the rise of these merchant houses, important merchant families uh, who, of course, did dust, uh, engage in dastardly trade of selling captured men and women uh, and spearheaded really the expansion of the slave-based production of the islands and coastal regions. At the same time, with the money that they've earned, they were spending lavishly because they need that capital to participate in this uh, 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 culture of consuming overseas import in greater quantity than never before creating a new form of genteel living. Uh, the ability to fill one's house with beautiful exotic objects was linked to reducing human beings into trade objects on one level, whose forced labor in turn produced new commodities such as sugar, coconut, spices for the world market. Right? Uh, you know, um, it's not a, a, a stark black and white story when it comes to uh, globalization and capitalism, uh, uh, the gains that were made uh, by those who uh, were in love, uh, in turn then gives us a sense of uh, that during this period, there were many uh, locals who were also able to, in some ways, refashion and intensify established consumption and collecting practices. You know, it expanded the base of this consuming cult consumption culture. There was an intense desire for China ware in the 18th century <coughs> that, uh, you know, the dishes spilled out of their niches, so to speak, to cover even the upper reaches of the entire wall. So what we see here is a new visual culture amongst uh, the merchant classes. If in the past, um, a porcelain or ceramic wares were kept in niches, right, in, in little sort of like enclaves and neatly displayed. Uh, now they take up the entirety of the hall. Uh, so it's no, not possible to determine when the, this manner of hanging became common. Uh, of course, it had earlier precedence in, you know, uh, European palaces. Uh, but it is significant that all the pieces are Chinese porcelain dishes from the 17th and 18th century, often called the Kangxi style export ware. So how can we make sense of, uh, you know, this new aesthetic uh, uh, display, this new sensibility almost? Uh, scholars who have worked on this often tend to emphasize that there is this religious significance and the, the role that uh, the ceramic ware play as a symbol of patrician refinement. So it's a way for the merchants to uh, uh, project that they are also culturally refined. Yet the fact that Swahili coast interiors are also filled with layers upon layers of exotic imports is 
difficult to reconcile with the idea that locals did not see these things as commodities. Yeah, so at the same time, I think there is a double vision happening here. Uh, so uh, while there is an uh, interest by scholars to often uh, emphasize on either the religious or the, the cultural sort of like uh, refinements or significance of these objects, I think uh, 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 recently, in more recent scholarship, there's, a need, there's an interest to also try to uh, find a way to balance the account by recognizing what is the commodity value and how do we read this commodity value in a more interesting way. So as you can see in this um, photograph here, interiors uh, would be brim uh, with, uh, you know, in the past uh, there was an interest in perhaps French mirror as you can see by the multiple number of French mirrors that uh, continue to, uh, that, that, that the cows continue to uh, keep, right? Uh, at the same time, there are also uh, uh, ab uh, abiding interest in, enduring interest in like brass candlesticks and also like different kinds of like furniture, mechanical wall clocks, gas lamp, all these kinds of like uh, objects uh, that one could get only from abroad. You know, the rich filled their domestic spaces with the commodity culture of mass production. These are mass produced objects. These are not things that have unique, uh, you know, uh, 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 value, uh, in, uh, intrinsically sort of like unique value. They were made by the multiple. Whatever symbolism of each individual object taken together, I think this assemblage was certainly also a carefully constructed exhibition. Uh, to exhibit something else, not culture as, you know, a, a domain of refined and genteel uh, living, but culture as an expression or projection of mercantile power and trans-oceanic trade. These were on many levels calling card. You create a calling card to uh, that that. How you, how you create a calling card that can demonstrate your prowess as a mercantile uh, you know, enterprise is to show it through uh, the assemb uh, assemblage of objects that you have access to. So to make sense of such a practice, John Middleton insisted on perhaps calling this a kind of conspicuous consumption only, then only became part of Swahili culture once the Omani Arabs became the new overlord on, in many of the Swahili towns from 1840s onward. And then he, he, he went on to say that it's actually important to acknowledge that uh, for a lot of these merchant patricians is, uh, in particular, the significance of these possessions as a signs of purity and honor uh, was something that uh, we need to remember. Uh, more than wealth, uh, purity and honor is something that you could derive from mass-produced objects. At the same time, while these are mass-produced to the extent that they could also be vulgar, it is in constituting them as an assemblage, as a display that uh, they acquire new effective dimension uh, in order to project this uh, uh, newfound mercantile power. So beginning in the 19th century, of course, then European pottery manufacturers uh, increasingly aid into uh, the preeminence of these uh, merchant traders. Uh, effectively dominating international markets, including that of East Africa. So, of course, the sad story or the tragic story is, uh, you know, global impact on industrial revolution and the aggressive colonizing agenda of European empires ultimately resulted in the collapse of this uh, trade of Chinese porcelain production for a world market uh, further. Muslim merchants, including Swahili car caravan leaders and seafarers, uh, was uh, 
increasingly marginalized, uh, given only a minor role to play in the trade of luxury commodities uh, in, the West, as in the West Indian Ocean as time wore on. And therefore, uh, over time, European and North American agents would soon replace them with the support of South Asian financiers uh, coming to control this mercantile economy here, uh, thereby ending this very unique chapter of uh, cross-cultural relationship uh, that spans the Indian Ocean between China. And hopefully in the telling of this story, what you got a sense is also that perhaps in finding a narrative out of the bind of needing to be very definite about who the owners of this culture is. What I'm suggesting is that maybe that is not the most important question to ask. Uh, we could ask more productive questions uh, by thinking alongside uh, the local interpretive frame, uh, understanding uh, what is the meaning behind specific uses and think of use in much more imaginative ways uh, that are that might challenge the way we understand how uh, we think of trade objects in the first place and ultimately uh, perhaps as we're also trying to understand and uncover uh, different uses of and uh, meanings behind an object uh, one thing to remember is always these are objects that exist in circulation and therefore always in hyphens. So they are objects uh, that have multiple sites of belonging and they're a great place to start if we want to begin to tell a different type of art history uh, that is centered on connectedness, that's centered on exchange and that's centered on interaction amongst different cultures across the world.